everybody. Welcome to another edition of Jazz Video Guy Live, which I guess is better than Jazz Video Guy Dead, right? Yeah. We're all live here today, thankfully. Uh, hopefully the pandemic is ending, the vaccinations have begun, and uh, we soldier on. And today, I'm very, very happy to greet a amazingly talented guy who's joining us from the East Village in New York City. I'm speaking about a multifaceted keyboardist, Brian Charette. Brian! Uh I can't hear you all of a sudden. I have unmute thing. Sorry about that. So many controls here. Awesome. Hello, Brian. Okay. Take two. How are you? Hi. Great, great to see you. Yeah, I apologize. Uh, okay. This one-man broadcast studio sometimes uh, gets weird, but everything's working now. So, right. uh, Brian, how did you get started in music? I know that you're from Meriden, Connecticut, not far oh, yeah. from my uh, childhood home of West Hartford. Uh, uh -huh. As a young man, how did you get into music? What was the, the, the uh, catalyst for you to begin this journey? My mother played the piano. Um and I would walk down to it at a very young age, and I just started to play it all the time when I was very small. And uh, so, was music an important well, uh, part of your household? Sure. My mother played the piano. I started to play the piano, and as soon as I was old enough to work, I was working in music, really. So I, I started to work as soon as I was, you know, of legal working age. It, a lot in music, really. I would play a lot of gigs. Um, yeah, from kind of the beginning. And what music were you listening to back then? I really loved progressive rock groups like Emerson, Lincoln Palmer. Um, I loved Bill Evans for jazz. Um, I loved Tower of Power for like funk music. Um, I listened to hard rock bands too. I loved ACDC, I loved Iron Maiden. All of this stuff that kids my age you know, were listening to. Van Halen, I love. And were you determined when you started working gigs? Did you see this as your path? I'm going to be a professional musician? Yeah, you know, I started to do it so much that I never asked myself that question. I just always played a lot of music. You know, I was playing all the time uh, from when I started it, you know. Especially when I started to play gigs, I actually grew up playing a lot in the Hartford area, which you know very well. And at the time, there were a lot of great clubs. There was a place called the 880 Club, and yeah. I played on a band that would play on Friday nights there called Street Temperature. I also played with Paul Brown, who was a great bassist. Um, and there was always a lot of gigs when I was a young person. Um, in the Hartford area, I played a lot in New Haven, too. Um, by doing that, I kind of, it kind of brought me to Europe before I came to New York. Um, there was a keyboardist playing in the group I was on tour in Europe with. Um, I had just graduated from college. They said the guy had a, play, a room opening up, and I called him when I got back to the States. And then I was living in the East Village. And that was 1994. So that's how I got to be here. And uh, where did, did you study music in college, Brian? I studied classical piano. My degree is from the University of Connecticut, but I studied at Hart School of Music, too. I also studied with uh, Charlie Benakis and Kenny Warner when I was 16 or 17. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, but after that, I... I, I just came here basically right away. Well, we certainly know Kenny Werner from his, uh, his playing, and uh, yeah, he, he wrote that book, oh. Effortless Mastery. Wow. So the book, when I studied with him, there was no, there was not even a book yet. You know, it was all based around this thing called the five finger exercise, where he would have you try to drop your fingers on the keys with no effort. And he would ask you things like, what temperature is the key? So it was very eye-opening. And I was 16, maybe, when I met him for the first time. And I had never really thought about anything like that at all before. You know. so. 
And what was the uh, the sojourn to Europe? Uh, was that to study, to play, to travel? What was happening over there? I was playing by um, by playing in Hartford in this group, Street Temperature, the bassist of the group, was named Bob Laramie. And he had been going on tour with someone named Lotso Deci, who's a trumpet player that lived in, he's from Bratislava, but actually went a lot to um, Central and Eastern Europe on tour. So I did a few of those tours and it was a pretty magical time because that area had just really opened up to us. You know, I think, what was it, 1989, the wall came down or 90? Yeah. So we were going to places where to me, a lot of people who lived in America had not been, you know. Um, and I was on, I would go on, he would go on six, he was very well known there. He he was friends with the president, like we would play um, for Havel uh, in the castle. We would play private parties where Havel would be. They, they were very good friends, you know, and we came to know uh, a lot of people who were doing cultural things in, in the Czech Republic. And that's how I met who would be my roommate, my roommate when I moved to New York. Really? Now, when did you start doing the, the multiple keyboard thing? You started on, obviously, on acoustic piano. When did you add organ and everything else, and how did that work? Well, originally, I was always, from when I started to play music, it was a lot about keyboards. Um, but before I lived in New York, I was playing all kinds of I had many keyboards when I would play uh, gigs. Um, in Europe, I was also doing that. You know, it wasn't really until I moved to New York that at first I started to play organ because I didn't really play organ before I lived in New York. Um, and I played, I played a lot of jazz, but jazz, as the years went on, I became, to, I, I was playing much more jazz music than these other more electronic things that I, was doing the electronic things actually came first even though i was playing jazz music all along and i would make records uh for other people playing traditional hammond organ but my things were always pretty electronic in the beginning and then you know i started to do mostly acoustic jazz music for about 15 years this is kind of new coming back to the electronic stuff i would say in the last uh two years or so and what inspired the move to uh, to more electronic music? I always like I always like the sound of synthesizers. Um, I was starting to go on tour a lot, and I started to bring another synthesizer that could do analog kind of sounds. Um, I got very interested in all of the technology, like drum machines, samplers, sequencers. Um, and I started to try to do everything by myself, which is what I have done since we've been sheltered in place. You know, I've kind of my only performance of my own music that's uh, regular is I do uh, a stream from my apartment where I play all my machines just by myself. So I kind of have a way to do music even though I love to play solo piano and I actually play solo organ sometimes. I think I have two recordings where I play solo organ, which is pretty uncommon, I think. Um, I do it now with the electronics and the machines. You know, there's always one thing I've wondered about organ players, and that's that uh, many organ players play the bass line with their feet, with their foot. Is that challenging? Is that hard to do? Most people now don't play the whole bass line with their feet, although some do. You know, Hammond also, a lot of people think about Hammond organ and they think about Jimmy Smith, which is actually 1955. You know, the Hammond organ came out in 1929, maybe was the first Hammond organ, maybe a little bit later than that. But there had been people playing it right along. They had a very different style. The bass was done mostly with feet. Um, Jimmy Smith with his kind of tapping, maybe someone was doing it before him, but he actually walks the bass line with his left hand and with the left foot, he taps almost one pedal and then sometimes he'll go a little bit up or a little bit down. Some people do walk all of the pedals and when Jimmy Smith plays ballads, 
he plays all of the bass notes on the pedals. But it's kind of uncommon to see a jazz organist only play the pedals for the bass now. It, it does happen. Joey D does it really well. There are people that do it really well. I think it's a very difficult skill to do. Um, and it sounds a little less smooth than the bass with the walking in the left hand and the tapping with the foot to me. Most jazz organists that play pedals now do this when they're playing some kind of uh, walking bass line, I would say. Most yeah. people. Well, I think of seeing Dr. Lonnie Smith live a couple of times and him sure. like getting down and playing the pedals with his hands. Yeah, he's, he's a wild man. I love Dr. Lonnie. You know, we get to hang, we both uh, go to trade shows for Hammond and we get to hang out together. You know, we unfortunately couldn't go this year because they only have virtual, the NAM show, I'm sure you've heard of the show before maybe. Oh yeah. It's kind of like uh, a show where um, people that make instruments have their people who play those instruments meet up and it's, it's a great hang. I couldn't go this year, but I usually see Dr. Lonnie there and, uh, He's a wonderful guy. You know, we'll take him. I'll go. Last time I was there with Akiko Suruga, who's a great organist. And we wanted to take Dr. Lonnie to lunch. And, you know, we couldn't even get three feet before everybody just mobbed him. And he had so much time for everyone and was so gracious. He's really something. Yeah. Well, Todd Barkin tells a funny story. Todd Barkin of uh, Keystone Corner fame. Was uh, booked uh, Lonnie Smith many times. No, I know him very well. Lord, he calls me Lord Charette. I think he calls everybody. Lord Everybody's something. Lord something. Like with yeah. Prez, it was everybody was Lady something. With he's Todd, a great Lord something. He's so a great he, dude. He told me that what because Lonnie Smith, Doctor Lonnie Smith, is known for two things. That in addition to his incredible organ playing, one is being Doctor Lonnie Smith, and the other is he always wears a turban. So uh -huh. Todd told me once he said to Lonnie, what, what kind of a doctor are you? Are you a PhD or a medical doctor? And he looked at him and he said, no particular kind. Okay. <laughs> why do you, Lonnie, why do you wear turban all the time? No particular reason. Uh -huh. So Lonnie, he's, he's a fantastic musician. What other organists? You mentioned Jimmy Smith and... Uh, Dr. Lenny Smith and the wonderful Joey D. Francesco, who lives up the road for me in Phoenix. What other organist from the past or organist today do you like and listen to? Um, I like a lot of my contemporaries. Um, I love Sam Yehel's organ playing and Gary Versace. Um, these two guys I really love who are peers of mine. Um, all of the organ players that are you know, around my age are excellent. You know, Pat Bianchi is great. Um, I, when I first started to listen a lot to organ, I was really into Melvin Ryan. Oh yeah, uh, West Montgomery's organ player. On those West Montgomery early records, and he has a very unusual sound. Um, he plays organ, um, has a percussion module, um, it can be on the second or the third harmonic. The third harmonic has a slightly higher pitched plank sound, and the second harmonic has a more woody sound to it. And Melvin Rhine and Samuel like this very woody sound of the second harmonic, which I felt in love with, um, which is very different than the Jimmy Smith sound that most people associate with the hand organ. So um, I was very into Melvin Ryan, and I loved his bebop lines. I also loved Don Patterson, who was a big influence of mine, yeah. especially with Pat Martino. Um, I loved Jack McDuff. Um, and, you know, I learned to play organ on Jack McDuff's organ, which is in Showman's, which I only found out recently. Um, so you were talking about the club in Harlem on 125th Street Showman's Lounge. Right, which is where I basically played the most Hammond organ when I was first starting to do it, I would say. So when we think of the organ, we immediately think of the Hammond B3, which was the ruling organ for so many years. Then all of a sudden, all these synthesizers come along in different keyboards. 
many uh -huh. of which make that same sound. How would you compare playing an organ on just a regular synthesizer keyboard versus playing a Hammond B3? I really like both. And the thing about an organ sound too, and this is not the truth with a piano waveform, but an organ sound is basically a sine wave. So it's, ba it's pretty easy to emulate with a machine. The hardest parts to get are the vibrato sound and the speed of the Leslie switch, this kind of stuff. But they're really good with that uh, right now. And they actually make clones of the Hammond that are the full size of the Hammond organ. Like you wouldn't even know it was uh, something uh, something new. You know, it looks like one of the old ones. There's nothing like the real. There's nothing like a real Hammond organ. It's got an amazing growl to it. They are very old instruments often, and it's common for them to to not be in a great state of repair, even if they are in good condition. You know, so. They're also 400 pounds, you know. Um, this is how much, this is my organ that I'm taking to my gig tonight. <laughs> you know, wow. and, it's, and it sounds incredible. Actually, they have an organ for me there tonight, but I'm gonna, that's my other keyboard that I'm bringing tonight. Um, and I'm gonna take the train to meet someone and get a ride for the gig, you know, so. And when I'm traveling, it makes getting a great sound a lot easier. And it's not to say that I don't love playing a real Hammond B3, because I really do. Um, most of the time when I play Hammond organ, the place has one there. Or someone has brought it there for me. You know? um, but for traveling, it's, a, it's really tough. And the new clones, like I, I have all the Hammond um clones um and they're great keyboards you know they sound amazing they sound like an organ it's still amazing to be behind the real you know you feel something too when you're behind all of the furniture too yeah it's, a feeling. it's, it's, it's yeah. an amazing uh instrument uh, the hammond b3 certainly uh let's look at a video here uh one of your videos called standing still uh We'll play it, then maybe you could say something about it. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, standing still. Now, is that from a particular recording? That is on Alphabet City. It's on one other record of mine too. I can't remember exactly which one, but that is a that is the first jazz song that I ever wrote. Really? Yeah. And how do you write? Do you what? Do you write uh, by assignment? Do you? Uh, do you write every day? Do you write by when you're inspired? What is your, your composition process? I write um, a lot. Actually, I don't pra I wouldn't say I practice a lot, but I write a lot of music because I have some events where the music, I have to write for it. And a lot of it comes about that way. For a lot of my tours, um, I'll go to a place and I'll end up writing brass music for like a classical ensemble because I have friends that work with them and, and they think it would be a great idea to collaborate. So um, also when I have a recording, like I have a new recording with the Sextet, that was a reason to write new music. Um, I guess in the last year I've written less music because I don't have as many concerts and as many recording sessions. Um, but usually I'm writing for something and I do it 
very quickly. I don't, I don't labor over it. Oh, thank you, Jerry. I love Jerry Weldon too. Me too. He's a fantastic musician. Do you ever see him with uh, with John Tendy when they play uh, saxophones together? At uh, no. John Tendy has also a great uh, jazz show called That Jazz Show. Maybe it's called. You ever seen that? It's a nice one. I, I have not seen it. Here's we got a couple of Jerry questions. Is on got a couple of questions and comments here. One well, ge a gentleman named Joe McGarity says, "Please give credit to Mike Brorby." Who sure. Is Mike that is, he owns the studio where that was recorded with uh, Galad and Ari. And many of my albums have been recorded. And in my opinion, that's the best recording organ in uh, New York, is at Michael Brorby's. And that's an A100, which is very much like a B3, but it's a little bit smaller. They tend to be in a little better shape somehow. And this one works very very well now speaking of recordings you mentioned that you've been working during uh, the pandemic and you released like the sun tell us about like yep. the sun so like the sun is just me and it's all of these electronics here um it's got drum machines um the compositions are all mine um some of them are earlier compositions that have been reworked but most are new compositions and it's all electronic, kind of trippy, atmospheric music, you know, with electronic beats. A lot of analog synthesizers. And uh, how do you feel about that, that process of recording everything? You, for me, it kind of started with Stevie Wonder back in the 70s, where he would, he would play everything, synthesizers, uh -huh. drums. Uh, now it's, it's, it's uh, something many people do. What is that process like for you? Do you just go one instrument at a time, or do you have an idea in your head before you record the whole thing? How does that work? Well, the interesting thing about this, like the sun, those were recorded in real time. There are a few tracks where I put guitar on after, but they were basically live performances, which is a little un uncommon in electronic music. Most people who do electronic music really labor over the production of it of it and this was recorded kind of like takes straight down so there was not a lot of the recording process was very easy i spent a great amount of time getting the keystrokes um, of moving all the machines where they had to that is the part that took a lot of time but the recording once i had that together the performances was pretty easy cool another question here uh from paul mckendrick in the uk wants to know your thoughts i don't know if you've heard it on the new Blue Note Lonnie Smith album, Breathe. Have you had a chance to hear that? I haven't heard Breathe. I maybe heard the one before where it's recorded live at the Jazz Standard. I'm not sure if that's the album before. Um, I haven't heard it. I'm sure it's great. He's a great... Dr. Lonnie is bewitching, you know. We were playing... We were in the Czech Republic playing at the... I can't remember Jazz Festival... Cheroff, maybe it's called. And he was playing with uh, Jonathan Kreisberg in that trio. And we sat like right behind him on the stage. And it was one of the most bewitching music performances that I've ever uh, beheld. You know, it's really something. Yeah. Jerry Walton is back uh, mentioning Mike, saying that he's recorded it there sure. many times with uh, Bobby Forrester. I used to, Jerry, I used to help Bobby take his organ out of that big white van when he was playing at Vigiones. Wow. Uh, which is uh, called Groove now on uh, McDougal Street. Maybe. Yeah, the, uh, the changing face of uh, uh, jazz clubs in New York. You mentioned the jazz standard. The jazz standard, unfortunately, is no more. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's obviously, unbelievable. I'm sorry? It's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable time for the world. Yeah. And everybody, everybody is, no one is untouched by it. You know, it's incredible. But it's been really hard for performers and for uh, clubs and uh, different types of uh, presenters. Uh, New York City is particularly difficult because it's a, it's a yeah. high rent zone. And, you know, sure. you can't go a few months without any income in New York City. So I know right, that... Especially if you $20,000 and that's like a small place. Yeah. Uh, 
And of course, we know about uh, the efforts of uh, Spike Wilner and Smalls, you know, to keep the right. club going. And he's had some problems with the state liquor board, trying to close them down. And, uh, you know, just a r really unfortunate situation. Hopefully. Tough environment. You know, art artists are kind of, we're not, we do things differently than the rest of the world, too. So sometimes we fall through the cracks a little bit, you know, um, especially when there's a time of emergency. People don't really say, oh, what about the artistic people? Or what about the, you know, we're kind of, we fall through the cracks, I feel like, sometimes. Um, I will say it was good. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sometimes that happens here. Well, the thing is, we need artists. We need this music, especially now. This is what gives us comfort and inspiration. And of course, we can yeah. look, listen to our recordings. But I, I must be honest with you. I always speak the truth. I enjoy live streaming events and stuff, but it doesn't hold a candle to Nothing being in a club. Not. I mean, I made it an well, I have two gigs this weekend, which is definitely a sign of something getting better because I can't remember the last weekend where I worked a Friday and a Saturday night. You know, so that's I'm very happy to be have somewhere to go. You know, what are your two gigs? I'm playing tonight at the Falcon, uh, which is in Marlboro, New York, and tomorrow I'm playing at the Roxy Hotel. Wow, that's that's a good sign. That's some positive oh, cool news. Cool but uh, there have been some good live streaming things. I mean, one thing at the beginning of the pandemic, Chick Corea was playing live from his studio every day for like an I hour, saw that. like 90 minutes. Yeah. I mean, you know, what an inspiration that was. Yeah, he's, he, was my, he was my favorite, too. He was the jazz pianist that I was. He was my favorite jazz pianist when I was, you know, learning how to play jazz. Yeah, to, we certainly miss Chick. His his uh, passing yeah. was a great surprise, and yeah, yeah. Uh, his contributions. Uh, people are going to be listening to Chick's music for a long, long time, and yeah. he's just a wonderful spirit. He helped a lot of people. A very positive energy, and yeah. uh, gosh, we certainly yeah. miss him. I only saw got to see him live once, but it was a great concert. Um, but I got lucky enough to record with. Uh, with John Patitucci and, and uh, Dave Weckl, who I loved in that first uh, acoustic band. And everybody loved him. He was a very, very nice man, you know, yeah. very approachable. Yeah, I saw Chick a, a number of times. Uh, uh, first time was with, with Miles. The last year he was with Miles, I saw him on at the Fillmore East on a triple sure. bill. Sure, that's, that's my neighborhood. It's like a block of two blocks away. Um, I saw him. It was on a triple bill. It was the Steve Miller band, Neil Young and Crazy Horse and Miles Davis. And it wow. was uh, Miles and Wayne and Dave Holland and Jack DeJeanette. And wow, that was incredible. And then I, maybe a year later, 18 months later, was the infamous Miles at Fillmore gig, which was recorded. And... Uh, you know, things were happening very fast then. We didn't know what Miles was going to do. Yeah. And uh, it was on a double bill with a fantastic singer named Laura Nero, <clears throat> who unfortunately passed. Miles came out. He opened the concert. The curtain went up. Keith Jarrett walked out. He was on the left side playing the Farfisa electric organ. Yeah. And then Chick came out on the right side. He was playing Fender Rhodes. And that sure. was like... Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. And then... Uh, Chick had the ring modulator thing, too, on the roads, right? That would make it go crazy. Yeah. Exactly. And then um, Keith left the band. Mile, uh, no, I'm sorry. Chick left the band. Uh, and Keith Jarrett stayed. Gary Bartz joined. Michael Henderson played bass. And then I guess about a year after that, I saw One Night, Incredible Night. I just happened to be on LSD that night, which made it even more incredible. <laughs> which I don't recommend. I don't endorse it for anyone else, but this is many years I've ago. never tried that, and I don't think that that would be a good move for me. No, I, I, I don't recommend it, but nevertheless... No, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to try that. It was it was an incredible night, and the, the, it was a double bill. I saw Miles at the Cafe Gogo. Richard Pryor opened for Miles, 
And wow. it was that band with uh, with Keith and Gary Bartz and Michael Henderson. Then I walked up to the Vanguard. It was the debut of Chick's band Circle with Anthony Braxton and Dave Holland. And, wow. you know, that music was like really outside, you know. And um, so I'm sitting there, you know, taking it all in. Anthony Braxton, you know, very out uh, alto player. And uh, if you've been He was to in the, Middletown. He was, in, he was teaching in Middletown too, right? Absolutely, mm -hmm. Wesleyan. Um, yeah. I think he might even still be there. So I don't, those of us who've been to the Vanguard, it's a basement club. You walk down the stairs and there's a greeter at the front who, you know, takes your ticket, or whatever. So uh, this woman, this matronly woman walked down the stairs. There was a break in the music and she saddled, uh, saddled up to the, the guy at the door. She said, is the music very avant-garde? At which point Braxton picked up his alto and went into one of his... And the woman turned around and walked back up the stairs. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> was afraid of that. Yeah, Jerry Walden says acid jazz. Yeah, it's interesting because there was a a, a genre uh, <laughs> that started in the UK called acid jazz. Well, would it be possible for you to play something for us? Sure. Here we go. Some I play jazz. piano, even though I don't really play piano too much these days. <laughs> appropriate spring is here and it absolutely yeah. is well before the show got started i asked brian how is it in new york he said it's nearly 80 degrees there today yeah that's a, a sign of summer not necessarily spring so yeah so brian you you've done so you've played with people like george coleman and chaka khan you've you've played in europe you've done your own recordings what do you look forward to doing that you haven't done yet in music I would like to write more for strings. I've written a lot for horns. I've written some for brass, but I haven't written a ton for strings, which I would like to do for sure. Um, I would like to further develop my electronic music for sure. And I want to record some more trio music for organ. Um, I'd love to play in a group with John Schofield or Pat McKinney. I think that would be amazing. Um, those are the ones that come to mind just now. Well, you mentioned Sco and Pat. Um, what other musicians uh, who are around today would you like to play with? Are there any? Yeah, there's a lot. There's, uh, everybody is good, first of all. Um, let me see. 
I I recorded just once with Vinny Kaliuta, but I would love to play with him more. Um, and he, when he part, first started to play gigs, I think he said he was from the Pennsylvania the Pennsylvania area, and he was playing with organ players. You know, um, so he was an incredible drummer. Um, I would love to play more with him. Um, I would love I. Before the pandemic, I was going kind of a lot to the West Coast. I love to play on the West Coast. I dream of living on both coasts someday, someday, so I can play in both places. You know, I love Los Angeles, um, and I love San Francisco too. Um, so when I'm in the States, I play a lot between those places and New York. Um, yeah, a lot of my dreams have come true too. I just I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm pretty into it. I'm pretty happy. I don't need a lot more stuff. You know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to perfect my presentation of, uh, of my music and my living. You know, I'm just trying to get it all together. Yeah, and I notice on your wall and on the stands on your keyboard, are you into some kind of martial arts thing? I did a lot of them for many years. I still do a lot of them. Um, these are. This is my main style. This is Fujin White Crane. This is uh, the first Kung Fu, actually, which is, some people say, comes from Da Mo, who was a, uh, a yogi. Um, and I do a lot of different styles of Chinese Kung Fu, basically. I do other things too, but that's my main. That was the thing that I've mostly been into since I started. Doing. And did you study with a master? How did you How did you learn that? Yeah, I studied with a master, a sifu or sifu. Um, yeah, and I and I studied white crane with him. Some of the other things I learned on my own. I actually did um, Okinawan karate when I was a kid, which actually comes from white crane kung fu. Um, so I I do it mostly to stay in shape and to keep my mind uh, focused. I don't, I don't really fight with anybody or do anything like that. Well, when you work with you know, different uh, martial arts things, it's really a discipline. It's a very serious undertaking. It's not about messing people up, but it's, it's like being in touch with your body in a lot of ways. It's very, like music. It's very much to me like music. I know? wanted to ask you, how has that affected your music? Well, you know, before, I would say I got serious about doing those things about 15 years ago or maybe 13 years ago. And before that, I had a very hard time playing music. It always made me very uncomfortable physically to play music for whatever reason. And when I started to study this other thing, I got so into it that I kind of stopped worrying so much about music. And I could almost instantly do it in a way that was easier than it was before. You know, yeah. So I think it really helped my music. So now when I sit to play music, it's very uncommon for me to not feel well in my body or not be aware of, of how my body feels. You know? Yeah, well, you have a very busy life in music. Uh, what are the other parts of your life? I mean, do you have any hobbies, any activities outside of music? I mean, when I, I do a lot of my kung fu forms when I'm not doing music, I also have a wonderful wife. We do things together. She's also a musician. Um, I've actually been exercising a lot since the pandemic started, like more than I ever have. Um, from those videos, I'm looking at the videos, I'm like 40 pounds thinner now than I am in some of those videos. So. Wow. Um, so I do the the forms to stay in shape. I also have like an aerobic boxing kind of workout, which is very good for cardiovascular. Um, and I've been teaching a lot. I do a lot of Zoom lessons now. My wife does as well. And uh, I do my stream every Tuesday night at nine um, for my Facebook. And I'm lucky to start getting gigs now. So. Looks like things are moving in a good direction. And how do you get gigs? You know, if you play a keyboard instrument, you get called. I know a lot of people have been around for a long time. I try to be nice 
it's it's not hard to work. I, I've never found it hard to get it fixed. I think if you play a keyboard instrument and you're kind of cool, you don't cause too many problems. I think it's pretty easy to work. It's it's something that everybody needs in music somehow. Well, I, I think it's one thing to be a good player, but you have to uh, have a positive attitude, positive energy. And you gotta I think, be cool. You gotta be. You gotta be a good hand. You gotta be friendly. You know? Yeah, I think that's what people want, yeah. for sure. They want to work with that's compatible. What, that's what I'm for, for sure. <laughs> individuals. Well, Brian has to uh, jump off here today because uh, he has a gig tonight in upstate New York. At a very cool venue uh, called the Falcon, which is in Marble, New York. I guess it's about an hour north of the city. Uh, who's on that gig? Johnny Rosh leads it. He's a great keyboard player. Um, Josh Dion is going to play drums. Oz Noy is going to play guitar. And I'm going to play Hammond organ. I have a nice Hammond there tonight for me. So uh, I'm, I'm very, it's a lovely place too. And uh, it's going to be warm. So they're going to have the doors open. It's going to be really safe it's a lot of space there so i'm looking forward to it you know we when i do the show we have uh, viewers from all over the world uh, we have a couple mm -hmm. guys from the uk a regular viewer mike farmer and uh, we mm -hmm. have uh, our friend carol from belgium and hi everyone just you know i, I never quite knew who's coming so uh here's what i would call i don't know what this where this came from but i would call it a zen question from a man named Jacob Mumford. Question is, what do you think? What, would you have an <laughs> what do you think? What's your answer to that? I try not to, and I struggle with that. I'm trying to not think. The Tao Te Ching says, stop thinking and end your problems. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I once asked Sonny Rollins, I said, you know, when you're improvising, you know, are you thinking about what you're doing? He said, no, no, I don't want to think at all. He said, and I said, well, is music meditation? He said, yes, music is definitely when meditation. I, when I, you share when that? I have a noisy inner dialogue, and when I play music, it's silenced immediately. It's the only thing that does that for me. Yeah. Well, uh, Jacob Mumford came back and says, of my music. I don't know your music, Jacob, so... Do you know Jacob's music? I don't. I don't. Okay, well, Jacob, hopefully we'll find out more about Oh, I music. think he wants to know what you think of his music. Did he send you some music? Not that I know of, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I would remember. Yeah. That's a name for some reason that I would remember. But anyway, I want to thank uh, Brian for joining us today. Uh, my friend Howard Mandel turned me on. You know, I did a show with Howard about six months ago, and I said... Who do you, you know? Who are the artists that you know? You need people to, people need to listen to that might know about. And you were the first person he, he said, "Yeah, you got to check out Brian." So I did, and mm -hmm. I really like your music, and it's it's fun to meet you. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Any closing words? Thanks so much for having me on the show, and you have great guests too. I always look forward to the show. So thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you, Brian, and uh, hopefully uh, people will check out. Uh, your new recording, uh, Like the Sun, and uh, go to his website and Facebook page. He does Zoom classes. I suspect he's a pretty good teacher, really articulate fellow. Uh, I've got a special show coming up on Monday. Monday is the 15th anniversary of the Jazz Video Guy. I have started posting uh, on uh, YouTube as the Jazz Video Guy in March, on March 29th, 2006. And uh, wow, here it is 15 years later. Uh, hard to believe. Uh, I've posted uh, videos I've produced and also archival videos, about 2,500 videos uh, during that time with about uh, 49 million views. That's a whole lot of views. Of course, uh, views, that's a tricky thing. I'll talk about that sometime. But nevertheless, happy that what I do uh, makes people uh, listen. I, people have an opportunity to find out about music and groove. You know, when I first, first started doing Jazz Video Guy, 
Uh, it was mainly because I had these video uh, clips that I wanted to uh, listen to, watch in other places. So I said, I'll just load them up on YouTube and then I can watch them wherever I am. And uh, it's worked out, you know, amazingly well. And next Friday on Jazz Video Guy Live on our regular show, my guest will be a wonderful guy and great drummer, Bill Goodwin, who uh, most people know through his uh, multi-decade association with Phil Woods. But uh, he's been around the music for many years. I'm sure he's, he's got a lot of great stories. And in closing, uh, 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 Brian and I were talking about uh, when playing music, best not to think too much. Our friend Lord Weldon, Jerry Weldon, a great tenor player, says, the less thinking, the better. So I totally agree with that. So everyone, uh, please stay safe. Uh, please uh, take care of yourselves and uh, keep listening to jazz. And if you can, join us on Monday for our anniversary show. <laughs>